Hi, my name is Matt Glaman, and in this video, I'm going to talk about deployment identifiers inside of Drupal and how you can set them to streamline part of your deployment process and how that deployment identifier interacts with Drupal whenever it is modified. So let's get started with understanding what is the deployment identifier. If we go to the settings.php that's provided with Drupal, which by default is this default.settings.php, there's a line and some documentation about it. The deployment identifier is used as part of the cache key for the service container. So with Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, we implemented the dependency injection pattern and we use a service container for that. And instead of building it every single time that there's a web request, that container is cached and it is pulled from the cache using a specific cache key. That cache key takes components of the Drupal core version, the current environment, and also this deployment identifier. So what you can do, as this code comment explains, is whenever you change the identifier, it can cause that service container to become invalidated. The way that I usually work with this is I set my deployment identifier to build to be the um, like the git hash that is ended up deployed in the site. If we look at Pantheon. We can even look at the Pantheon settings.php that's shipped by default. They create their own Pantheon deployment identifier. Um, I'm gonna walk through some of these other ways that they use it later on, but they automatically will set this for you. And if you use platform.sh, this is set for you automatically. If we look at, find it in the code, it takes the existing deployment identifier or the build tree. But this dependency injection container is rebuilt whenever the deployment identifier changes. So let's dive into where that is done and what that looks like. So inside the Drupal kernel, but before I even get to the kernel, let's look at index.php. So index.php is the script that is served for Drupal. When we come in, it loads the autoloader. And right here we get kernel is Drupal kernel. We get an environment of prod. If you look at apps like Symfony or Laravel, this will often be a dynamic value that could be local, QA, some other item other than prod. And we also receive the autoloader. And this is what's used to bootstrap the service container and a handful of other things and then handles the request. So it is like the entry point and exit point of a request in Drupal. But what we wanna look at is at the Drupal kernel and this container cache key. So the cache key is made up of several entries. Service container, the current environment, which for Drupal is always prod. The Drupal project doesn't really have a way for easily swapping that value out. The current Drupal version. So not only would changing the, de the deployment identifier modify this, so would an upgrade to Drupal core itself. Then the identifier, the operating system and a serialization of the container YAMLs. Um, there could be, you could add additional YAML files and if those are added in your settings.php, then it would also bust the cache. And that ends up with a cache ID like the following, where we have service container prod, the kernel version, or sorry, the Drupal version of 9.2.0 beta 3, we're on Linux, there is no deployment identifier, so it's empty. And then we have the default services.yaml. There's another place that the deployment identifier is also used and is highly important if you're using APCU caching, which side note and another topic, you should be using it. It is used as part of the APCU prefix. So this ensures that if you set a deployment identifier, your APCU caches will be invalidated normally you have to restart PHP FPM to invalidate those. All right, so now we know how the cache key is created. Let's see how it's used inside the Drupal kernel. Um, so first we can see here, cache Drupal container. It takes the definition, which is an array, and then it shoves it into the cache table and get cache container definition. This is where it tries to retrieve it. If it receives a cache, it returns the data. And then this is used inside of initialize container where it will build the container and this is re-entered so it's supported if the container was already built and you're rebuilding the container in a single request but it comes down here if there's no module list and it's already explained in here so it will do a forced rebuild which tries to retrieve the definition from the cache 
So let's go ahead and we'll just do, I'm going to flip on Xdebug and we're going to walk through this a bit and see what happens when we refresh our Drupal site. So I am running DDEV locally. So I'm going to go ahead and do DDEV Xdebug to turn on Xdebug, right? And we'll turn on PHP Storm to listen. And I'm just going to refresh the home page so we can see what happens with the whole life cycle. And since some folks may have not stepped through this process entirely. I'm actually going to drop a breakpoint in index.php and we're going to step through this life cycle so we can see everything that's happening. So I'll go ahead. I'm going to hit refresh. PHP storm is going to ask me where I want to point the incoming request to. Um, it's web index.php. So it found that we're here. So we're in the Drupal kernel. So let's just step in and see what's happening. I need to set up my path mappings which would be, this is actually there, dub, 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 HTML. So I'm going to step up because we're in the auto loader right now. And now we're inside the Drupal kernels, kernels construct. So you can see we have the environment of prod. The class loader is the auto loader from um, composer. Allow dumping is set to true by default and our app root is null. So we you could technically provide your own index.php that customizes these, but with the app root as null, it guesses the application root, which is web HTML web. So now we set the root and let's go back through and see what happens. So it, it creates the request and I'm gonna move my breakpoint here for the next request. If we step into boot, we get the configuration. If there's any from the file class, by default, it finds the cache backend class that might be used. If we had APC fetch, and it's setting up a few things. Now, if you, you're used to Symfony or Laravel and even Net, the service container or the kernel is usually dumped to a file. Drupal does not do that. We just dump an array of the container definition and we recreate the class on runtime. That's the big difference between Drupal and a, you could say a more classic PHP framework like Symfony and Laravel is you wouldn't see something like this here is the actual PHP file would be dumped to a private file storage. And that is what would be loaded instead of calling the kernel and then finding the cache container and calling this, this bootstrap class. So I'm going to step over and we're going to go into initialize container. And now we should be hitting where we need to step into it. So let's go in and we're, we'll step over and cache. You'll see here, oh, wrong button. So you'll see in the cache here that we have the CID and we have data. We have all the data here where we have various aliases that were defined. We have all the parameters that are used. Like here's all the modules that are installed. So if you haven't actually played around with the service container, debugging this value is Pretty neat because you can see how your site's configured. Like we have these cache bins. Um, here's our cores config, but we want to see also there's like our services. And this is the big deal here is a lot of times people run Drupal cat or Drush cache rebuild or rebuilds Drupal's caches because they modify the services.yaml or there's something that needs to be discovered. But the problem is when you rebuild Drupal's caches, you're blowing away a lot of other data, a lot of other caches. It's expensive which can be a big deal when you have an e-commerce site with 20 million products, or you have a content site with 30 million pages. You don't want to just blow away all that caching because that is very expensive to rebuild. So by using the deployment identifier, you can start tweaking a few things to have more specific cache invalidation. So we'll step over that. We get the cache data and you'll see here that I jump up, we did not co compile the container. So I'm actually going to stop the request, which killed the page. And I'm just going to open our database here. I do have my DDEV database connected so that I can browse all the tables. And I'm just going to delete this. So I'm just going to do an actual delete so we can walk through what happens on a cache miss. Um, you did a cache rebuild, it deleted this line, so it recreated one. So let's go ahead and hit play because we've been there. So initialize container. We'll just step through some of this some more. You'll see here that we did container definition and get cache container definition return null because we deleted the cache value so nothing could come back. So we're going to step into here and now we get compile container. So let's step through 
the container needs dumping is a flag that's used to dump it to the cache or to export it the array definition. So this then does initialize service providers, it gets the container, it sets several values, and this is taking all the statefulness of Drupal by discovering the modules that are used, the install profile, it's generating all the namespaces. So all the namespaces for every single module that's there. Because in Drupal, we don't dump our namespaces completely to the composer autoloader, only some things in core are there. Otherwise, namespaces and autoloading in Drupal is extremely dynamic. As we can see here, we're gonna do it for each, and these are taking care of some of the components and dynamically finding their namespaces. I'm gonna go ahead and click the run to cursor so we can skip over some of that. And in the container, it's going to dump all the namespaces. So even though it's not dumping to the composer autoloader, it is at least putting them in the container. And it's saying a few more items here. It's loading the YAML for the container and going through all the service YAMLs, loading them. So we can see here core.services.yaml. If I were to open that file, you'll see it's now going to process all these parameters and also all the services provided by core. And this is also kind of an expensive operation. So I'm gonna just step through, because now it's doing it for every single module, and it would go through every site, and it creates the definitions, and it ends up compiling the container. So let's go ahead and we're gonna to jump to this line. And right now our container has all this data in it. If we step into the compile, it's going to go ahead and compile the container, which there's these things called compiler passes, which let you alter the service container when it's being compiled, which is essentially taking the raw data and then transforming it. And now we have the built service container. If allowed dumping, we're going to create the dumper, which is something that Drupal has provided. And then we get the container definition, which is the array of data that gets cached to the database. So we go through here and it's going to start the session out and I'm going to press play and you'll see here that we now have the site. If I go back, we now have also our cache entry in here. So to illustrate this on a little bit higher of a level, let's look at some service providers that are inside Drupal modules. So when I talk about this compiler pass, actually let's look at compiler pass. So compiler passes are used as a way to inject data into the service container dynamically. So let's look at the cache context pass. It adds the cache context parameter to the container. So let's just drop a breakpoint here. And if we refresh our page, I'm going to drop this breakpoint. You'll see that our code didn't run, or rather the breakpoint wasn't hit inside of this con compiler pass. So let's go ahead and try to get this to run. Now we could do it this way, where we just delete the cache container entry and refresh the page. And if we give it a second, now we've hit our pass and it finds all the tag services and it creates an entry for all of them. Um, let's actually just drop a breakpoint here. So you see we have all these different cache contexts. If you're not familiar with cache context, it's a Drupal um, system that allows us to have a instead of caching on a specific value, it says, hey, with this context, I need to be cached based on this context and dynamically go check the value to see if my cache is invalid. Um, it's leveraged to provide highly performant caching when you're authenticated. So go ahead and play, and it's going to do the container rebuild. So when this page finishes loading, we'll have our cache entry and we'll be rocking and rolling once more. So again, refresh the database entry, we have this here refresh the Drupal site, nice and fast. There's no um, breakpoint that's hit. So let's show what happens when we set a deployment identifier. So let's change this to be one, two, three. So we've created a deployment identifier in our settings.php, which modifies the global settings. And if I refresh the page, notice that it's already taking a little bit longer and we've hit our compiler pass. And if I hit play, We'll wait for this to finish loading. As it recompiles everything, the page is finished. Now, if we look at our cache container, we have two cache entries. So you'll see that we have now our deployment identifier in the cache key. And these live for, they're meant to never expire. It's not, it doesn't have any cache tags that can be invalidated. So the idea is that it lives forever, as long as it can, until the container is explicitly rebuilt 
or the deployment identifier has changed. If I were to go into my default services.yaml, I'm going to do a copy and a paste, and we're going to call it services.yaml. The settings.php is set to find this file by default. All right, we've copied the services.yaml and we're going to modify a value in here that changes how Drupal behaves and then modify our deployment identifier to show that something changes. So I don't wanna modify in the session parameters or the twig config because then we run into the whole render caching items and this modify, recompiling the service container won't affect your render cache. So let's look into here. We have this, um, we have this value of response debug cacheability headers. So if we turn on our dev tools, and we go to our network, let's reload the page, and we'll take the first request. So if we look at the main headers and the response headers, we have cache control. We have all these other things, the cookie, the surrogate control, um, because we're using big pipe. Now let's go ahead and turn this to true and see if we can actually find where this is injected. So I'm gonna do shift command F and go to debug cacheability headers. And it's in this finish response subscriber. There's a construct on all responds. So if debug cacheability headers. So I'm gonna drop a breakpoint here. And as you'll see, it'll add headers that tell us about the caches that were used inside the Drupal request. So if I refresh this page, we don't hit a breakpoint because even though we modified the services.yaml right here, it doesn't know that we made a change because we need to change our deployment identifier. So let's change this to four, five, six. And if I refresh the page, so it's rebuilding the service container, which involves finding all the modules. And now we're on the tail end of the request where we get the response cache ability, which we have all of these wonderful cache contexts. We're logged in, so there's a lot more involved in all the cache tags. So this says that if any of these cache tags were invalidated, this page response should be invalidated. So we'll go ahead and hit play to go through there. And if we look at the headers from the response, you'll see now that we have the Drupal cache max age, it's on cache will because we're logged in and we receive all the contexts that are there. And we did all this without blowing away our dynamic page cache or doing any of the, you know, like a full cache rebuild. So that's the important value in using the deployment identifiers is if you need to make a really basic change to the site, let's say that you are using a headless Drupal site and you need to modify your cores config by leveraging the deployment identifier, you don't need to do a full cache rebuild and lose all of your caching just to say that we have a new allowed origin. You know, if you're not familiar with cores, it's a security setup for Ajax requests that prevents browsers from making a request to a server when it's not allowed to. So you maybe launched a new front end and you need to add that allowed origin. You can make the change in your services.yaml and just modify the deployment identifier without having to do a full cache rebuild, which makes me want to go back to Pan Pantheon. So Pantheon has an interesting setup, which they use a rolling temp directory on deployment. So they actually tie in the deployment identifier into the secret used for the twig storage. So not only on a deployment does the deployment identifier get modified in the service container rebuilt, it actually invalidates all of the twig templates. So your twig templates get recompiled which may or may not need to happen depending on your caches that are available. So once something is invalidated, it creates a new compiled twig template. So I hope that's an interesting bit about deployment identifiers in Drupal and maybe you learned something new. Um, I'll be doing a few more videos that talk about using these more in practice and other ways to do a more high performance Drupal deployment. Thanks.